The LA. <laughs> Cold War has to have a moral. Otherwise, what is it all about? Power is inflicting pain and humiliation. Power is tearing human minds apart, putting them together again in new shapes of your own choosing. Power is not a means, it's an end. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Well, and here we are for our fourth episode. Uh, with you as always, I am Richard. Smith, aka Richard Blaine, and uh, my friend and fellow researcher Bill Clay. We're not. Related. We have a, <laughs> not related, and we have a wonderful show for you. Thank you very much for listening to us. So we have a great show, and the title of this show is uh, Christopher Dorner: The Incredible Manhunt, and it's really about it's about Christopher Dorner, but it's about so many other different things. Uh, the the story is really really exceptional. There's lots of mysteries. There's lots of different problems with the official narrative. There's lots of rabbit holes, and there's a lot. There's a huge ensemble cast that stretches across, really, frankly, across the country, and potentially into multiple different countries. So it's a very fascinating story. Not a lot has been written about it. You, know, you will not find a great deal about it in books or even online. There, there's, there are some resources. There are some documentarians that have done uh, a decent job of kind of introducing some of the major problems with the narrative. Um, but there's really a, a paucity of information out there. So um, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to at least introduce people to the major issues surrounding the overall topic. And so uh, in this first segment, uh, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Bill here uh, take it away. Bill, what's our first segment? Well, the first segment is really what the basic media narrative is on the story. We're back now with new details tonight on the other big story that's gripping much of the nation. The manhunt for that former Los Angeles police officer accused of killing three people in revenge shootings earlier this week. And from the from the start, um, the, the first thing that happens is that two individuals, Monica Kwan and her fiance, Keith Alexander, are gunned down in a parking complex in Irvine, California. I believe it was February 3rd, 2013. And, and Ryan, the first thing that happens, you're talking about the first thing that just starts the domino effect that really starts the action. Right. And the police, the responding uh, detectives and police had no idea who the uh, shooter was. I believe there are 13 shell casings. So this wasn't just a stick up gone wrong. This wasn't, this was, this was an execution, and they had no idea who it was. And very shortly, they 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 come to believe that Christopher Dorner uh, is is their man, and he's a former LAPD cop. Uh, he had been a cop until I believe two thousand and eight, um, and he had been in the Navy. He had received some. Uh, quasi special forces training and he posted uh, a message online what the media consistently refers to as a manifesto um and in the, in the the document in the communication dorner says that he's going to basically you know lay siege to the LAPD and all their families and their children a manhunt is underway in Southern California, and the Los Angeles Police Department is under siege. 10,000 law enforcement officers are conducting door-to-door -door searches for one of their own. Until they admit the truth of what was done to him uh, officially and administratively. He declares war on the LAPD to, only in so much as he's declaring war on the individuals that he's listing out as as targets and he's and, and we'll get more into this in, in another segment but he also he contradicts himself he says that he is going to go up against the lapd but then he says no you know i'm not gonna you know basically widow somebody indiscriminately just stay out of my way i really just want these handful of people and their families right right and so the the short version of the story is that dorner uh is suspected of, of those two, the murders of uh, Monica Kwan and Keith Alexander from Irvine, California. Uh, and then uh, by February 15th, he's surrounded in uh, Big Bear 
in San Bernardino, basically northeast, uh, far northeast of Los Angeles. And he's surrounded in a cabin uh, and dies in that cabin. Um, you know, if that was the, the, the end all of the story, that would be one thing. Well, but well, one- he doesn't just die in the cabin. The official narrative is he su- he suicided. He he shot himself. He, he he killed himself. Right. Well, that that didn't come out until later. You know that didn't come okay, out until fair, fair enough. That didn't come out until later. But but when he's surrounded, he is the subject of every single layer of every single law enforcement in California. This man who who is accused of killing, I believe. Four people, was that right? Four is the the total number? Correct. Correct. Four people and every ounce of law enforcement was thrown at him for almost 10 days. And at at many points, he was outwitting them. There were several days where they could not find him. They had no idea where he was. They were asking for help. They thought he might be in Mexico. They thought he might be, you know, parts east. They just had no idea where he was. So it was a major media story. It was a major manhunt. Um, the government finally does get their man. He's dead. He can't tell any other, you know, dead men tell no tales. Um, and that's that, right? But a right. Few th- so that's the basic narrative is guy goes crazy. He has some, he has some legalistic reason and he got maybe slightly screwed over at work. But boy, he really went out of control and, you know, kill these people for no reason. And that's that. You know, some of the problems in that narrative that start emerging right away is the LAPD shot up uh, two women who were delivering newspapers, I believe at like four in the morning. And, um, you know, two, so the two LAPD- Mexican, two, two small Mexican women. And just for the record, Christopher Dorner was six foot tall and he weighed 270. At a, at a, he, a minimum of two. I think at the time, at the time of his death, I think it was probably larger than that. But yeah, the, the big, guy, a very big boy. The guy basically looked like Ving Rhames in Pulp Fiction. Yeah, um, I mean, he looks like he could he could crush people. Yeah, and um, and and so there's really very very little chance they confused they confused the two. But anyway, they were very trigger happy, and I think people were very suspicious as to why. And the internet starts to really uncover. I think parts of the narrative that don't make a lot of sense. And then I think the, the, the part that really just throws everybody's uh, uh, spidey senses up is that people listen to the live radio traffic of the final uh, showdown, the final siege in big bear around the cabin that, that Dorner Dorner sensibly dies at factually the narrative is they, they try to shoehorn it into being something very, very simple. And then there are certain things that are, major incongruities with the the media narrative that start to come out. And then the more you look into every aspect of the story, everything, the, the, the wheels are falling off the bus. Um, And so, you know, then, then they blame him for a shootout in Riverside, California, where two police officers were shot. One's very severely, one died. Um, They blame him for a shootout that happened three minutes prior to that in a different town. That was, you know, that was a few minutes away. Uh, where an officer's head was grazed by a bullet. Uh, they blamed him for tying up an 81-year-old man in San Diego. Um, and if you don't know the geography in Los Angeles, these places are all over the place. And and there's no consistency to where he's found. Just the, the official narrative, on if, if you were only told the basic story, guy goes crazy, guy kills some people, guy's caught, and guy, you know, guy dies. Okay, that you know, that that it is what it is. But when more details are added to the story, major questions start to to evolve. And maybe, uh, uh, Rick, if you can start telling maybe the basic facts of Dorner, that would help as well. Um, You know, he had a career in the Navy. Um, What what were those dates, Rick, that he was? Well, yeah, and, and, and before I get into that, just real quick, I just want to point out that, you know, you mentioned one of the biggest things that got everybody interested in, in the topic at towards the end, the radio traffic, right. Uh, that was happening at the time that was broadcast all over the universe. Okay. 
because it was played live on TV. But even before that is not only the manifesto and because the manifesto was, was very well written and it wasn't a manifesto of someone who was at least, you know, on the surface, completely batshit crazy. I mean, it was coherent, right? He had, he had a beef, right? Um, and, but then the other thing was, and you pointed out the extraordinary amount of resources that were de- dedicated to this man. A million dollar reward, you know, was issued, and that's in addition to multiple other uh, rewards that were offered as well. There was another hundred thousand dollar reward. But anyway, so I, I think you know there was lots of different pieces of this that really drew people in, um, and then got people questioning, "Hey, what the hell is going on here?" Well, I think um, but the facts the facts on his life are very. Uh, you know, if you were to profile him, he kind of seems like a goody two shoes. You know, he, right? Well, he, he definitely was a rule follower. But let's let's take a quick break. Boom, gotta get that. Boom, 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 that boom, 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 that boom, 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 boom. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome. Okay, so we, we're back, and thank you very, very much for listening. Um, I am Richard Blaine, and uh, with me as always, Bill, Bill Clay. Clay. We're going into our second segment, and our second segment, we're going to talk about a little bit about the background of Christopher Dorner. Um, Christopher Dorner, it's not clear based on our research yet or anything that I've uncovered or we've uncovered it's not clear whether or not he was a military brat or not. There's, there's very, there is not, I have not come across any information about yeah. Dorner's father, which is interesting. Okay. Because he grew up all over the country. So, and we know this from a variety of different sources. There've been different news sources that were rep- reported on different places that he grew up, but we also know it because he told us about it. He tells us about it in his manifesto and he actually directs, you know, reporters to say, to go research him. So we know that he, for example, that he, he lived, he went to uh, you know, primary school in Connecticut. Okay. Uh, and we, you know, he describes a few incidents there. We know that he spent some time in Florida. Uh, we know that he went for a while. He, he lived in California uh, uh, as a as possibly an adolescent. For a while, he went to, I think, California Lutheran College for a semester. Then he transferred to uh, a college out in Utah, and he played, he played football for, it looks like, approximately two seasons two seasons and I'm sorry the information in this area is is very is a little bit sketchy um, but we do know uh, from different sources that he did play for at least two seasons he's a huge guy I mean just very very strong um, so it, it's not surprising at all after he graduates from uh, Utah and, and and really it's interesting wherever he goes just as a side point wherever he goes and he lists some of these people these some of these individuals in his uh, manifesto, but wherever he goes, he makes friends. He makes lots of friends that that he likes and that like him a lot. Yeah. They and and to a man or a woman, they all describe him as happy, smiling, very positive, upright, a good guy. The the sort of friend. I mean, multiple friends have described him, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically as the sort of friend that you want you would want to have. Right. The sort of friend that everybody wants to have. And, well, and if you look at his manifesto and the pictures that the media was using of him, you know, they have him in his Navy whites and his his dress uniform and then they have him in a camo. And in both photos, he's given a huge grin. And I mean, the guy the guy did not look in the media photos like a troubled individual. I mean, he didn't. He didn't give the faith of someone who was going to be a, a mass murdering psychopath. Not at all. In fact, I mean, if you look, so um, I, you know, you know, just today, I, I don't, I haven't had a chance to upload them yet. But I've, I've done a little bit of a dive on finding additional photos of him. I cannot find a photo of him other than a uh, security camera photo uh, in which he is not smiling. 
Yeah. All of the photos that are of him are of him very happy. I mean, just not, you know, not a fake smile, but a genuine smile of being happy and a naturally happy person. So it's very, I mean, it's very strange. Um, and, and this but, is a guy in his mid thirties who's been honorably discharged from the U S Navy, who's a homeowner, who's got a, you know, still has family alive. You know, his mother, you know, I think his, his mother was living in Las Palmas, which is where he was staying when, when he was working for the police in, in LA. Um, you know, this isn't typically somebody that goes off the reservation and shoots up, shoots up the place. Right. I mean, that's not, that's not the stereotype. He's not like, a not dis- at all. He's not a dis- fact, loner. Correct. Correct. And in fact, you know, uh, he's, he's the type of guy who, if he found a bag of money would turn it in. And in fact, he did turn it in. He did turn in a bag of money when he was living in Oklahoma. So after, after, yeah, after he goes well, to was, college, he found it on the street and it was $8,000. Well, it's it, it's an interesting story about that. So after he after he graduates from Utah, uh, he enlists in the Navy. Uh, he he you know he tries to become a naval aviator. Uh, he, you know, he he can't because they ultimately academically he washed out. But the Navy thought a lot of him and and saw him as a resource, and they they steered him in a different direction. He ends up in like around two thousand four, I think. I think it was. He's in Oklahoma. He sees, you know, he and a, and a buddy, they come across a bag of $8,000 in, in cash. And it turns out that the outside of a church, and it turns out that the, the money was ultimately earmarked by the donor to go to this specific church. He, you know, uh, donor didn't know that at the time, but he called the police and ultimately through the police investigation, that's what that's what's happened. And the, in the police report, he's quoted. He's quoted as saying, look, this was this, you know, it, it looks like this money might have been going to a church. I didn't know, you know, uh, I'm, you know, my integrity matters to me. Blah. blah. I mean, he, he uses those words, well, you know, my the, integrity, etc. What that I remember from that article was him saying this was the right thing to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, is that is that the sort of guy who, you know, you know, who normally walks off the reservation and starts popping people? Well, let's fast forward to 2007 when he is, you know, coming back from the Navy. So, he, yeah. So he well, real quick. So, you know, eventually he goes into the Navy reserves. He goes out, you know, start, moves out to California. Right. Because of the, I believe because of the Navy in like the San Diego area. Uh, he you know, he uh, applies to start working with the uh, LAPD and he becomes a trainee. He gets attached to a particular trainer by the name of Teresa Evans, Teresa Lewis Evans. Anyway, so, she, you know, she's, you know, uh, his trainer. And there's an incident in July of 2007 where they're called to the Doubletree Hotel in San Pedro. And uh, apparently there is a, a guy who's like laying on a bench and just kind of just being an asshole. They get called oh, out sure. there. He's non-responsive. He's non-responsive. Yeah. And, so and they, let, they get there. They try to get him off the bench. Um, he's still acting funny. They eventually get him to walk along and he's schizophrenic. It turns out later. And so he's he's doing crazy things, um, and just to get to the TLDR here, they they both he and Teresa, you know, his trainer Teresa, who's on the on the left, and Dorner's on the right, get him on the ground, and Dorner's using his weight to pin him down, um, and Teresa takes out a taser and is tasing him, um, and then uh, he's Dorner's still struggling to get his arms. And doesn't want to let up because he's going to get loose, you know, if he um, if he lets go. And so Teresa's trying to get compliance for the guy to put his other arm behind so Dorner can handcuff him and starts kicking him. And so while he's while the, while the defendant is face down on the pavement, um, you know, this this woman's this, you know, uh, officerette is kicking him in the right clavicle, the left clav- clavicle. And then in the face, right? Multiple times in the face. Yeah, and um, and Dorner like doesn't really know what to think about it. The you know the sergeant shows up, 
Dorner is asked, what did you do? And so he answers accurately. This is what this is what I did. You know, I, I did this, this and this and this. And he didn't report the uh, the kicking. He, he figured that Teresa would report the kicking when she told the sergeant. Later, he basically discovers that it's not reported. And he also notices that, you know, this guy is, you know, pretty well bruised and and um, and uh, beaten up by the, you know, roughed up from the kicking. And so I believe it's two weeks later that he files the report of you. Accepting- well, and, and, and Evan specifically tells him not to say anything about the kicking. Right. According to Dorner. So, but go ahead. Yep. Two yeah. Two weeks and, later. And so two weeks later, he files, he, he files the notice um, and they do an invest uh, internal affairs investigation in the internal affairs investigation. It, it turns really Kafka esque on Dorner. So Dorner, you know, is, is, Mr. Good Guy doing things by the book. And what does internal affairs say? They say, well, we can't prove that this actually happened. Okay, well, that that may be true. There may not be a lot of evidence. Now, um, the defendant's father testifies on Dorner's behalf and says, no, this this did happen. Sorry, you mean mean the victim? The victim. The the, the victim slash defendant, right? I mean, um, the schizophrenic guy's dad says, you know, I witnessed physical characteristics that look like he was beaten up in the way that Dorner described. And the internal affairs investigation. Well, and he also he also said he also said that his son, so his, his son is is Christian, yeah. you know, told him this. Yeah. At the time. At the time. Right. Yeah. And so the internal affairs investigation says, well, we can't prove that it happened. Now the standard of evidence is preponderance of the evidence which is basically a uh, – what is that, uh, What is that, Rick? What standard is that? 51%. 51%. Um, and so that's that, – all things being equal, what's more likely than, than not, right? That's, that's the way they're supposed to look at it. And so you have Dorner, you have the father, and you have the victim all saying one thing. And then you have Teresa saying another thing. Well, the preponderance of evidence, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, is very clearly in Dorner's favor. Yeah, you know, I so and it's interesting. So they, they're according to uh, according to Dorner in his manifesto. Dorner says that there's a video. Mm-hmm. Dorner says that there's a video that exists that was actually shown to the board of rights, the BOR, the board of rights. And, uh, but however, interestingly enough, there's, you know, uh, upon reviewing the LAPD report that actually came out after Dorner's death, because they reopened the case, they, they issued a new report in both that report and in, in the invest, uh, the, uh, inspector general's review of the report, there's no mention of such video. Right. And, and, well, and the, and the, video, the video has no doubt been destroyed by now. So, I mean, oh, sure, certainly even I mean, it's, 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 it's been, been disappeared. But, but the point is that Dorner reported kind of a minor issue, right? I mean, not the biggest issue. And he even says in his report that he believes that it was authorized that, that she, she wasn't, she wasn't um, uh, totally beyond, you know, this wasn't a crazy, you know, thing, but it was excessive. It was excessive force. And so this is, this kind of comes off as a minor transgression, but what they do is they say, well, uh, we can't prove that it happened, you know, Chris Dorner. So we're, we're not going to make a ruling. And Oh, by the way, now that you filed this, we're going to write you up for making false statements. Well, that's a totally different thing, right? I mean, you're, you're punishing the whistleblower. You're creating, you know, punitive measures for someone who's trying to tell the truth. Is there any evidence other than the self-interested statement of, of Officer Teresa that that Dorner's story is not accurate? No. Does not well, a single piece of evidence to that effect? Well, and, and, and this part's really important, okay? So I've seen a lot of news articles which have kind of misreported this particular issue because, okay, so... Within, when, when, when they start bringing him up on the charges of falsifying, you know, his statements, right? Yeah. Um, 
then Evans goes after him and says, he did this in retaliation because I told him I was going to, you know, he was still a probationary officer. He was still in training at the time. And I told him that I was going to give him low marks. Right. Right. And so there, you know, I think it's been the LA Times and a couple of different news outlets, which is which reported that, you know, three days prior to his complaint, um, which was two weeks after the incident, he'd complained two weeks after the incident. But they say that three days before his complaint, uh, he was given low marks by Evans. However, that's not what the inspector general's report says. Is the the inspector general's review of the LAPD report, which, which came out in June of 2013. The inspector general says that there was no evidence. Okay, this is important. There was no evidence that she had given him a bad review at any point or had ever threatened to have done so. And in looking at his record outside of, you know, a few minor things here or there, he was a good he was a good officer. You know, he had he had a great track record. So there was nothing negative there. And so I, I think there's there's a, there's a, um, there's a miscommunication or a misinformation campaign out there somewhere within the media. I don't know what the, what the deal is. Well, and I think, you know, Rick, correct me if I'm wrong. Our viewers can't get that version of of events without doing probably five hours of research if you knew exactly where to, to look. If you, if well, I mean, if you knew, I mean, if we told everybody where to look, you might be able to find it. But on your own, you're not. I mean, on your own, you'd be lucky to find it in twenty hours. And, and what does that mean for the Dorner story starting out here? That Dorner's complaints in official grievances, his description of events seems entirely accurate. It does not seem like the crazed ramblings, the manifesto of a mentally deranged person. He very well may be mentally deranged, but at least Correct. on this point, he is not incorrect based on right. the documents that we've reviewed and the things that we've looked at. That Correct. And, and that's and, and basically definitively screwed over. Correct. I mean, now I will say this. I, I thought that and we talked about this before, you know, before the show. But I, you know, I think that the inspector general's review of the LAPD report in June of 2013 was pretty even handed. You know, it said that, you know, uh, now, I mean, you got to drill down to these different uh, rabbit holes. But, it, you know, it did say that Dorner's story, you know, he gave seven different reasons for why he waited two weeks yeah. uh, to, to talk about it. And there were he had five different opportunities to to give it and blah, blah, blah. However, uh, if, you know, if you realize, it, however, the, the IG report does not say, well, it was five different opportunities over only a two week span, two weeks ain't a lot of time. Right. And if you are thinking about going Serpico on uh, on, you know, and crossing the blue line, you know, you got to, you know, that's some that's not a light de- a decision that you take lightly. And according to the uh, the officer that he reported it to, his name escapes me at the moment. But according to that, that particular officer that he reported it to, Dorner appeared with tears in his eyes because he felt really bad about having to report it initially. Right. Which is now, very telling. No, we're spending a lot of time on this and I want to I do want to move ahead here because there are problems with the, the rest of the story. But, you know, he was from from all review, from all all accounts, I all credible accounts, he was screwed over in, in 2008. And so that went on his record. Well, it, it did. And let me, can I, let me let me just wrap up the segment real quick. OK, I'll try to I'll try to get it done pretty fast from there, because and, uh, I'm going to do it fast because there isn't a hell of a lot there. Right. So after this, after this incident. Um, he gets, I believe he gets deployed there. He, he gets deployed for basically like a year or something like that. I think at this point, and I could be wrong about this. I'd have to double check, but I think he gets deployed to like Bahrain or some of the play or Iraq oh, or something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. And so, um, so this whole issue is on ice. He gets back the board of the board of rights, you know, the hearing occurs. Uh, they ultimately issue their ruling. Uh, as to his conduct, and I think it's January of '09. I'd have to double check on that. But he gets terminated, so he's terminated. Then 
he files he files you, you that decision that administrative decision is appealable to a to a state court in the state of California he appeals that and he loses there and then he goes to the California Court, court of Appeals and he ultimately loses there on in a, on October 3rd of 2011 right. so after after that well between 2000 the, the last record publicly available record okay uh, of Dorner and the Navy okay other than the fact that he was honorably discharged on February 1st of 2013 be, the the last record of him being with the Navy is in 2009 at Fallon Naval Station you know Naval I guess Naval Air Station Fallon in Fallon Nevada which you know he, he owns a home in southern Las Vegas which is a hell of a long distance away from Fallon Nevada but be that as it may you know between 2009 and his discharge in on February 1st of 2013 there are, there's there's nothing it's 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 a ghost it's right. it's goose egg nothing there and so, so just he, to back up on the timeline here so 2007 the incident happens with the schizophrenic guy 2008 right. the hearings happen 2009 he's terminated 2011 his appeal fails october 2011 and then uh he's finally honorably discharged from the navy February 1st of 2013, the prior day he had posted his manifesto, so-called manifesto, to Facebook, and then Monica Kwan and Keith Alexander, I believe, are executed on the 3rd of February 2013. So these these are not events that are one week apart. They're all several years apart. And that's what doesn't make sense. Right. Why? Well, let's, let's take a quick break and then let's let's get into that. Yeah, so let's take a quick break. Quick word from our wonderful and generous sponsor. That boom, boom, pow. Them chickens jacking my style. They try to copy my swagger. I'm on that next shit now. I'm sold 3,008. You sold 2,000 and late. I got that boom, boom, boom. That future boom, boom, boom. Let me get in there. Boom, boom, boom. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome. Ain't no God in Mexico. Ain't no way to understand how that border crossing feed in Mexico. Crime Think with Rick Smith and Bill Clay. Crime Think. Crime Think. Crime Think. No relation. Um. So we were talking about the manifesto and and really kind of what was setting Dorner off before we get into the manhunt itself. And, you know, uh, Rick, I know you've, you've looked into the manifesto and I know you identify with it in many ways. And, you know, you know <laughs> thanks. <laughs> basic tenet and, of transcendental meditation that you subscribe to. But, um, well, and I really, I, I appreciate you flagging me for all of our different national security agencies. You're so. welcome. Um, but I mean, I think when I first read it back in, back when it came out, I remember just being struck by like, holy shit, this guy is like, this guy is like a man child thanking Ellen DeGeneres and like thanking President George H.W. Bush for his service and like how wonderful he was. I mean, the manifesto is not a statement of principles or like, I'm trying to change the world for these reasons. It's like shout outs to his favorite celebrities like Ellen DeGeneres. So, I mean. You have to so you have to read his manifesto in full, mm-hmm. and it's it's so damn long. I mean, I forget how many thousands of words it is. It's a it's a very 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 long read. Okay, and there's an enormous amount of information there. In fact, you know, we were talking about this before. I mean, we could do an entire show just, and we probably will at some point. You know, uh, just on the manifesto itself. Okay, because I think there's there's a lot of different things here, and you know, just to, to, to uh, you know, we we don't have enough time for this particular show to get go in depth and do a deep dive on it. But I do want to. There's a couple things I do want to point out. Okay, first off, I think it's very clear from reading the manifesto and from everything that we've read that this guy, his personality. Okay, and this is and this comes out from every interview from every friend that was interviewed. 
you know, there are thousands of different news articles that have been written on this. And in every single one, for every friend that has been interviewed, it, it talks about Dorner being the kind of guy who gives a shit about the rules. Okay. There was a, there was a uh, superior of his within the military who you know, uh, talks and gives an anecdote where the guy, the guy's name was like, I can't remember what his name was, but let's say his name was Justin. And he you know, said, you know, soldier, I want you to call me Clinton from now on. And Dorner said, yes, sir. And he said, you know, that's the kind of guy Dorner was, you know, you know, if I tell you to jump, you know, he's going to ask how high. And that's what really come, you know, that's what really comes through. Yes, he does talk about Ellen DeGeneres in a, in one paragraph, you know, at, at the very end of his spiel. Most of the manifesto talks about a couple different themes. The first theme is he's talking about how he got screwed. And he goes into very extreme detail about, and he makes a lot of different factual allegations, some of which we've already talked about, okay, but some of which are not talked about in other places. For example, he alleges that there was a video of this guy, um, Gelter, Gel, uh, Gelting, is it Gelter? Anyway, uh, the, the victim who was kicked in the face, right? Mm. Uh, he says that there's a video of it. And, that there, and at the Board of Rights hearing, that the, the, the uh, officials at the Board of Rights hearing actually saw this video. In addition to, you know, Gelter or Gelting uh, being interviewed, as well as the father of, of that victim being interviewed, um, th they all saw this. There's no mention of any of that. There's no mention of any video uh, in in the IG report or in the LAPD report. Mm. Um, also very, very interesting. He goes into detail about how specific people fucked him over. OK, so he names names. You know, he, he says he was he was screwed over by uh, the man who was a former uh, captain in the LAPD that, you know, Quan. Yeah. Uh, he says he was screwed over by him. He says he was screwed over by a number of different people. He says he accuses people specifically, and this is something that's not discussed uh, in the IG report. Uh, he says that there was a conflict of interest. He said that the the head of the Board of Rights, uh, and I think which which who I think was Eisenberg, uh, as, along with everyone else, you know, uh, or, sorry, sorry, it was Captain Phil uh, Tingridis. Captain Justin Eisenberg and city attorney Martella, he says, had a significant problem. Um, he said Tigridis was a personal friend of Teresa Evans uh, from when he was her supervisor at the at the harbor station. Uh, he also said that the uh, advocate for the LAPD Board of uh, Rights was Sergeant Anderson. Anderson also had a conflict of interest as she was Evans friend and former partner from Har <laughs> former partner from Har Harbor Division where they both worked patrol together. He asked to have them both removed when he, he discovered that relationship, uh, but he was denied. Um, he, interestingly enough, there, I mean, there's a lot of different portions of this, which have not been reported wildly, or, sorry, wi widely. But one diff one thing that he, you know, uh, he was accused. This is probably one of the, the more latent and interesting items here. He was accused of having bullied, uh, another officer by the name of Abraham Sheffres, okay, in, at the academy. However, it turns out that Abraham Sheffres' father was a Holocaust survivor and that other officers were making fun of him and singing Hitler youth songs. He, he, Dorner. Honestly, though, like I read those parts of the manifesto and I just, I, I thought that those were some of the biggest bullshit lines I was hearing. I mean, it just, you know, it, it's kind of like a white person saying, like, I have black friends. You know, it's like, it just, it didn't, it, none, a lot of that did not ring true. I think what's important is that he gives a ton of specificity about how he was administratively screwed. The work, well, the and, work and, environment may have been shitty and probably was, but, 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 but I, I think screwed. that's the and, point. And I, he got screwed, but so, and I went into a little bit too much detail, but it's hard not to, but 
he actually, I think what happened was he stood up for a lot of different people and for himself on multiple different occasions. There was that particular incident with Abraham Sheffrace, but uh, before that, or I can't before or after that, there was also an incident where there were there were two Mexican police officers uh, who called him a nigger, uh, and who also you know continued to use the N word against a variety of you know other different people, and he called them out on it, uh, and uh, he reported them for it, and they were suspended for it. Um, and they were suspended for, for something like 20 days. Um, so he had reported officers previously prior to reporting Teresa Evans. So I think reading between the lines here, he was just, he was still in training mode. He was still a probationary officer and he'd already been complaining about and, and reporting on other officers. They wanted him out of there. Yeah. You know, you know, he had crossed the blue line a couple times and he's not even a full fledged officer yet. Get yeah. him out. Yeah. So, you know, to wrap everything up here, you know, some of the themes through here, throughout his manifesto, his name means something. His integrity means something. Um, you know, he can't stand corruption. He can't stand hypocrisy. Um, but then he also goes off on some weird tangents. I mean, just, I mean, weird in the sense that they're just incongruous. You know, he's, uh, he's, in full favor of an assault weapons ban. He's, you know, he goes hardcore against school shootings. He's pissed off that he was even able to buy some of the weapons that he's going to be using purportedly in some of these different shootings. Um, he has a, he has a strong amount of uh, self pride in his own ability level. He goes on, he drones on for like a page and a half, you know, listing every sort of different military acronym you can imagine that he, he knows all these different tactics and strategies and blah, blah, and weapon systems. And he's going to shove it all up their ass. Right. Um, and and I, I don't know. I, I don't believe in the manifesto. Uh, you know, there are multiple stories that say that it was posted on January 31st. There's other people who say it was posted on, I think, February 4th. You know, if he posted it on January 31st, he went into work the next day with the Navy and got discharged. If he posted it on the 31st, he's referring to executing people in the past tense, people that he hasn't even executed yet. Well, so, he, in, in, the, in the manifesto, in the manifesto, he doesn't he doesn't talk about anybody in the past tense. That's in the in the Anderson Cooper stuff. Well, the Anderson Cooper stuff arrives at CNN on February 1st. Right. That, so that's the one, but but in terms of the manifesto, he doesn't talk about anybody in the past tense. Yeah. Sure. So, but but the point is, these doc. The, I'm I'm using the manifesto in the the, the materials that he mailed to Cooper, you know, sure. together, and um, I don't believe that he wrote them, and I don't think that someone who is planning to do what he did, if he's if he actually did what he did, would be so foolish as to announce announce himself you know well and i think here here's the other thing that doesn't make sense i want to make I, I need to i need to look up on this to see what he, do you remember what what his what his uh bachelor's degree was in uh we look I think at it may been political science i i want to say it was political science right yeah maybe we can check our our notes here um I, I'm almost positive it was it was he had a, 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 a he majored in political science and he minored in psychology. Yeah. Um, and, and so here's what really doesn't make from from that standpoint. If you're a political major, okay, I don't know anyone in the country outside of a couple of different pukes in the Beltway who are just complete whores um, who love Obama and love George W. Bush. Yeah. That doesn't make any fucking sense on planet motherfucking Earth. I'm sorry. Right. I mean, am I wrong? Am I wrong? No, and there's 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 a bunch of things that just don't don't add up with this guy. Um the manifesto is one part of it. The fact that you would reach out to Anderson Cooper as a middle 30s black man in the military, um I just I don't Sorry, I'm not buying that either. Um, 
you know, he had been living for several years in Las Vegas uh, and then came back to California uh, for two or three weeks and then began the rampage. Uh, the people back in Las Vegas said that he was prepping his house to sell it. Uh, you know, if you've ever sold a house before, there is nothing you do other than sell that house. You go into full time sale mode, cleaning the house, getting it ready, talking to your realtor, patching things, fixing things, lowering the price. Like, I don't believe that you planned a multi week, multiple murder excursion while you were prepping a house to be sold in a different location. It's just not, it's just not normal. Not really. Well, yeah, no, that, that clearly, that doesn't make sense to me. The timeline doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, we talked about it before and I think the, there is one version of the timeline that makes some amount of sense with a lot of speculation in it where maybe he couldn't re up his term in the Navy or he here, here, real quick, real quick. Let me just, let me just finish up the, let me finish up the manifesto. Okay. In well, quick, quickly finish it up. I know, I know. All right, so, all right, this is how incongruous, all right, his manifesto is. He loves George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, uh, Hillary Clinton, Governor Chris Christie. He hates Wayne LaPierre of the of the NRA. He hates Fareed Zakaria and wants him to be... <laughs> And wants him to well, be. He's supported. right about that one. He's, he's <laughs> yeah, fuck that asshole. Um, you know, he loves General Petraeus. He loves General Co- Colin Powell. He loves Ellen DeGeneres. He hates the Westboro Baptist Church. He loves Tim Tebow. I mean, this is all over the place. There's not a person on earth that loves all these people. Well, and, and to and the point where he's like giving Tebow career advice in his manifesto. Right, like it's just it's it's pretty nutty. Um, but he does he does love Charlie Sheen and thinks he's fucking awesome. Which at this part is at this particular time period in world history, I would agree. I love Charlie Sheen as well. True, true story. Um, but he also uh, supports he supports he supports LGBT, but yet he also, according to the manifesto, supports Chick Fil A's right to freedom of speech. Yeah, I mean. How, I mean, this is no one does this. No one feels this way. Right. And um, and I think that, you know, I don't like shows where uh, give you evidence, but don't really put the right analysis on it. You know, 2013, w- with the benefit of retrospect and the benefit of hindsight, we now know that in 2012, the federal government was abusing the IRS to shut down dissident political movements, namely the Tea Party. Uh, we know that in 20. 20- was it 2012 or was it 2011? Uh, the Benghazi attack where the the government was trying to run man mm, 2012. Uh, yeah, 2012 man pad stingers uh, to ISIS through Benghazi in, in Libya um, and let four Americans die to not resupply them in order to and the ambassador them. and the ambassador. Um, you know, they let the ambassador get uh, butt fucked by you know jihadis rather than uh, <laughs> rather than save him and, and screw up their story. Uh, we know that the government is running guns to Mexican cartels without serial numbers, so that they can probably come back into America and you know create an impetus for gun control. Uh, you know, there are all these like major crimes that are being committed by Washington and. Then we have all these lone gunmen who look a lot like Timothy McVeigh and uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and, you know, all these disaffected military loners who uh, go off and do horrible things, right? You know, the manifesto doesn't make any sense. The timeline doesn't make any sense. The manifesto goes out of its way to hate on gun rights for someone who would never in a million years hate gun rights. He goes and he kills people, right, with those guns. No one who 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 has these outlooks and beliefs and values would do the things that this guy is accused of. Maybe he had a psychotic break. Maybe he fell on his head the wrong way. 
maybe they mixed up his anti psychs at the prescription. I mean, many things. Well, could, I, I mean, mean interestingly yeah. enough, he does say in his manifesto that he he would like his brain preserved for science, which I guess isn't going to happen considering that he was a charred corpse. But the other thing is, you know, he said that he had multiple concussions from when he played football and that he did experience some depressive, you know, depression as a, which he attributes to the concussions. Right. Which is, which is interesting. Just historically, it's interesting because that's long before that really became kind of a national issue. Sure. But anyway, sure. But, but my point is that I don't think it's, it's a stretch to say that there's at least a possibility uh, that this is part of the, the scandals of, the 2012 era where horrible things were being done in the name of creating a political movement in the political will to speed along gun control and to speed along uh, political conflicts. And well, and, and, and you don't, you don't want to name this particular issue, but I'm just going to say it. Sandy hook. Yeah. Sandy hook is, is another one, you know, um, I mean, a school, which was, not unlike Waco, demolished. Right. Just completely destroyed and rebuilt. Right. right. Why would you do this? So, <laughs> like, why? So, you know, and that, and that kind of leads us into probably our next commercial break, um, but then a real kind of a digression on, on the media malpractice that went on with the Dorner, the Dorner case. And, I mean, the TLDR on it is they never got away from – crazy Navy black man shoots people for no reason. You thank God he's dead. I mean, that's, that's basically the level of analysis our, our media put into it. They were boxed in a few times into having to report a few inconvenient facts. Uh, but let's talk about that after we have a word. Did from me, I didn't see the line in time and like a fool. In front of God and everybody, I pull blew my food. Ain't no God in Mexico, ain't no comfort in the can. When you're down in Matamor, it's getting busted by the man. If I had not seen the sunshine, hell, I would not cuss your rain. Feet would have fit a railroad track, I guess I'd have been a train. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome. When you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. Put all the money in and let it roll with you. When you're hot, you're hot. Ooh. La 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 la. La 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 la. La 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 la. When you're hot, you're hot. Is that uh, Chris Dorner's theme song? <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's so good. Mm. Uh, no, I, I no. This is this is this is Chris Dorner's theme right here. Tell you what, forget the money. What, what, what are you doing? What do you mean, forget the money? What am I doing? I'm talking to an empty telephone. I don't understand. Because there was a dead man on the other end of this fucking line. <laughs> So All right, media malpractice. The the basic media malpractice is that there's a there's a really strict narrative that they initially they they, they report the Dorner case in in many different directions, and then very quickly they start using certain phrases over and over. Right? They talk about a rambling manifesto, and a rambling manifesto posted online that becomes a solidified part of of the story, and they also say that he's killing innocents. Well, how do you declare them innocent without doing any investigation? Maybe they're guilty. I don't know, right? I mean, I'm I'm the guy who doesn't know. For some reason, the media well, to say to say 
to to call them innocent or guilty is to make a value judgment. Right. Right. Because innocent according to whom, guilty according to whom. Right. Right. I mean, and that's and that's part of like the the whole media malpractice in general, in which they will just unilaterally declare things to be one way or the other, you know, from a from a value standpoint, and then they'll just, they'll just move on. It's it's unattributed, you know. There is no citation. This is just the way it is. You know, like or the 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 greatest one is well, you know, a discredited study, and that with without attribution, move on, right? right? Oh, it's just a discredited study. And and so the main beats in the, the Dorner story are, um, oh, he ex-cop and he killed two people in Irving, you know, uh, Monica Kwan and Keith Alexander. Um, he uh, tried to steal a boat. He tried to tie up this 81-year-old guy. At 10 o'clock last night, police say a man fitting Dorner's description tried to steal a boat in San Diego. He pointed a handgun at the victim, who's an 81-year-old male, and demanded the boat. He was unsuccessful. Later, Dorner's LAPD badge was found nearby. Um, and, by the way, and by the way, we talked about this too. He tried to steal a boat, and then some... You know, this guy was in the fucking Navy, all right? And he trained with boats, okay? in With riparian boats, okay? Boats in, like, coastal waters. He's a coastal waters boats expert. OK, and yet somehow he fucks up the engine on this 81 year old, you know, assholes boat and it can't go anywhere. And so instead of stealing a different boat right after he ties up this 81 year old asshole, he just abandons the whole prospect. He was supposedly and this is according to and I'm sorry to, to go on, but this is according to a U.S. Marshal affidavit. Which says that he abandoned that Dorner abandoned his effort to flee to Mexico because he fucked up this boat because the to- because the, uh, the 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 line attaching the boat to the to the to the pier got tangled in the the uh, the propeller and fucked it up. Yeah, I mean that doesn't make sense. The man's a fucking navy guy. Well, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But I mean, this is part of the media story. Is is you know, the, the shooting happened, Dorner did it. Uh, the boat thing happened, Dorner did it. Um, you know, then there's a shootout in, uh, Corona, uh, California where, uh, uh, an officer's head was grazed by a bullet. Clearly Dorner did it. Then there's a shootout in Riverside, three minutes away at one thirty. Well, you, 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 you left out your favorite part though, about the gas station guy. Well, I'm going to talk about that in a second. So, you know, in Riverside, there's a shootout with two cops that get blasted by automatic weapons fire. Clearly, Dorner did it. Um, and then, you know, he has a shootout up in San Bernardino. Uh, he flees into a cabin. He takes two people hostage. He runs away. He goes into an abandoned cabin. He's surrounded by police. He sets himself on fire. End of story. Right? Right. The good guys win, the bad guys lost, you know, n- nothing else to see here. And then you start looking into it, and I'll tell you, I mean, I think Rick and I both have like a, a 100% level of s- cynicism and scrutiny of the media. And I, I don't know about you, Rick, but I was really stunned at how bad the media malpractice was in this case. Um, yeah, agreed. So let's just start with the uh, the shootings of, of Monica Kwan and Keith Alexander. No witnesses, uh, basically no evidence other than shell casings. Anyone who's no prints, no prints. Uh, no anyone weapons. who looked into uh, forensics knows there there are like three or four things. You know, the paraffin test, uh, hair samples, and shell casings are basically the police's way of saying, we have no fucking idea, but we have somebody we want to blame, and this is our way to do it, right? It's not real. Right. It's not real evidence. <clears throat> um, so who killed Monica Kwan and Keith Alexander? I don't know. The police didn't know either, and then somebody looked on Facebook and said, oh, this this guy hates uh, Kwan's father. It must be him. And that's how they made the connection. They, they reviewed social media and they said, here is this tenuous connection to, to Monica Kwan's father. It's got to be Chris Dorner. 
And then we fast forward to the boat. The boat is an 81-year-old guy who said, somebody jumped me. He was a big, stocky guy. He put a, you know, uh, a hood on me, on me and tied me up. And I, I found it, you know, I got loose an hour later. Um, he never describes the race of, of who took him hostage. And he never describes Chris Dorner. The reason they tied Dorner to the San Diego boat incident is because they find his briefcase and a badge of his uh, like a mile away uh, by the airport. And they're like, oh, well, well, and that's well, it has to be Chris Dorner. Well, and that's after they already found his badge. Well, they, they, so yeah, they, he keeps he keeps shitting out badges everywhere he goes. <laughs> like so, so on on February fifth, so the the whole way that they make the connection between Dorner and you know Alexander and Quan is supposedly in uh, was it was it uh, natural natural city nation city whatever the hell it is national city. National City. In National City, they they somehow magically find footage, which this doesn't I mean, this doesn't even make sense. How do they just somehow find random footage of some random alleyway somewhere in which they have footage of Dorner and, a, and a, with a pickup truck? Somebody who's supposed you can't tell from the footage if it's Dorner or not. It, it's a it's a large black man. OK, yeah. which could be Dorner. It could be Dorner. But we don't know, right? Anyway, and you can't. And the license plate is obscured. You can't even read that. He's 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 throwing some shit into a dumpster. Whoever he is, anyway. But according to an aff- an affidavit that was filed in in conjunction with uh, a search warrant request, they say, well, we found his badge along with his uniform that was dumped in in National City. Uh, a day in two days after the deaths of Quan and Alexander. And based off of that, that gave us the idea to look up, you know, uh, this guy named Dorner. And so, and lo and behold, we then found out that he posted this manifesto on, on Facebook. Uh, but at that point in time, they, they specifically mentioned that they found his badge. Right. And then so on the ninth, stop, stop, stop. So they find his badge in national city. They find a badge in San Diego and then they find a badge on his dead body in in Big Bear. So it's like, how many badges do these people get issued? Right. It, it's crazy. I mean, so it's three different badges. And and again, as we were talking about before the show, you know, anybody that knows, you know, any police anywhere, um, you know, the, these you get you you're issued one badge, right? And that's it. Okay. Yeah. And the badge that you're issue, issued. Is not some toy plastic, you know, piece of shit badge. This is a heavy, solid metal badge, and it's an honor to have it, to possess it. Okay, this is important to you know to to a police to, to every police officer. Their badge is their shield. Their right. shield is sacrosanct. Right. Anyway, so, so, so the, the notion that I know he has so, like three is ridiculous. Badges. Yes, we got it. So there's. There's really nothing pointing to him seriously in San Diego. Um, and then, you know, the, the shootings in Corona come off of one guy who who's a tow truck driver who is sitting at a gas station and he saw a guy. And, and so there's a manhunt on the way underway by this point for, for Dorner. And there's a re- reward being issued. And so, you know, everybody has this huge financial incentive to be the one that calls in calls in Dorner. From the Mexico border to Los Angeles, there have been dozens of false sightings of Dorner. Well, the guys, at, you know, it's like one o'clock, one fifteen in the morning, and Dorner, uh, Dorner's, a, you know, this guy says that Dorner's at a gas station gassing up, and he thinks that he sees him inside the gas station, you know, buying something, and he looks at the license plate and he says, "Well, I don't know what what kind of car he's driving, but I'm going to go run the license plate because tow truck drivers." have access to the basically the lean system, the, the police officer's uh, way of looking up uh, uh, license plates. So he goes and he runs the plate. The plate comes back as somebody else. It doesn't come back as Dorner. He calls it in anyway and says, well, I don't know if this is Dorner, but the guy looks like Dorner. So, you know, cops, please come uh, uh, check it out. The police are on the scene. They, they find the, they're there pretty quick. They they drive after him. There's a shootout, 
and one of the officer's head is grazed by a bullet in Corona. It's the LAPD responding. And then uh, Dorn, the Dorner is accused of driving three minutes away to Riverside. He drives up to a light or accused of driving up to a light um, and basically lays on automatic weapons fire on two officers who are just uh, parked at the light. The officers weren't on to him. He just pulls up to him and blasts them. So the dash cam footage has, has finally been released. You don't even see Dorner's car or truck um, on the footage at all. You don't see anything. Um, so the, the one officer is severely wounded, one officer is killed, and a local cabbie uh, who sees all this go down runs over to the car, radios in officers down, you know, shots fired officers down, and says, oh, by the way, it was Chris Dorner. He just took off. Well, that guy later, both of these guys, the tow truck driver and the cabbie, both later file claims for the reward. So I don't think it's a the one million dollar reward. Yeah, there's there's a huge incentive for them to blame it on Dorner, and there's also a huge incentive for the police to blame it on Dorner, right? I mean, because then you don't have to solve the case, and the only thing that's going to time to it are these stupid shell casing matches, which I don't think have any legitimacy anyway. Um, and so the next thing that happens is he drives up to Big Bear. And um, is is up there for a while. Um, well, and then before Big Bear, I want to put this in real quick. So the, the whole, the whole th- the one one of the reasons why it it's the, the the killing of those two officers. Okay, the, that doesn't make it's totally inconsistent with what he says in his manifesto. Yeah. Okay, he, he he specifically says, "Just stay out of my way." Right. Okay. And like I'm paraphrasing this because he goes into extraordinary detail about what he means, and he says on multiple times, "Look, if you back down, I'm that's fine. I mean, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. If if you back down, I, nothing will happen to you. Just go away and stay out of my way." So for him to affirmatively go out and kill these people it, it is not even consistent with even this bullshit manifesto. But yet, right. continue, right? So the you know we find out later that the LAPD is protecting uh, around fifty people who they think are targets of Dorner, and Just, spending and, and spending in excess of three hundred men in, in the process. I found that number by the way. It oh, was okay. in excess of 300, 300, 300 men, three hundred sworn quote unquote three hundred sworn officers. To protect all those people, which Incredible. is basically a military operation, just to protect these fifty assholes, right? Well, especially when you consider that that the Los Angeles Police Force is only ten thousand men, right? So, right. Um, so, you know, there's really nothing placing him at any of these crimes. There's nothing connecting him to any of these crimes. Uh, there's a shootout in Big Bear. Um, with uh, a park ranger, um, a, a sheriff's deputy is killed. Um, he carjacks one guy. Um, he, you know, he, he, car, he carjacked the park ranger. Oh, was Haldebreak a park ranger? Yeah, Haldebreak was the was the park ranger. Oh, sorry, I didn't I didn't make that connection. And then he uh, he's holed up in an apartment for a few days, a rental apartment. And then the the husband and wife uh, come upon him. He bursts out from a bedroom and says, like, you know, be calm. And then basically wrestles both of them to the ground, hog ties them, you know, puts a hood over them, you know, uh, puts a sock in their mouth. And apparently he doesn't hog tie them that well, by the way. Yeah, I mean, they they still couldn't get out. They they escape. They escape within like half an hour. Uh, They didn't escape. They called uh, 911 and then the officer. No, 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 no. what, what, what I mean is they, they, they get out of the hog tie yeah, sufficient yeah, yeah. that they can yeah. call for help within 30 minutes. Yeah. Like, that's um, ridiculous. And so he runs to a different cabin, and then he's surrounded. I mean, and- I could I could hog tie somebody. Well, great. And well, they would well, never fucking that. get out of it. do that on your own time. That's great. Well, I mean, I, you, know, some, you know, me and my wife, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so sometimes it's her, sometimes it's me. And then the cabin's basically sieged by like every law enforcement officer possible. Um, <laughs> yeah, it really is like Rambo. Yeah. 
When Dorner was finally cornered in the mountain cabin five days later, another problem arose. Officers from all over the region raced to the scene on their own. Rick Brazil was the lead investigator on the report. The 400 plus to 800, depending on estimates, officers that, that de self-deployed up that mountain were not needed. In fact, they got in the way. Was that something you expected, anticipated? I did not. San Bernardino County Inside, Sheriff John McMahon I've, says the unrequested response by individual officers was overwhelming. Folks came from all over Southern California and the incident command system went out the window. That's because sheriff's commanders could not communicate with the majority of the cops who self-deployed, so they had no information. And the report says many of the officers were out of their cars with rifles pointed downhill toward the action, even though it was more than a mile away. Who were they pointing their guns at? I think the reality is they may have been pointing some of their guns at their own fellow officers. The report indicated that it was so chaotic that some law enforcement officers say it was a miracle that no one else got hurt. You're absolutely correct. It was a miracle. And then, um, and, uh, you know, the cabin catches fire and burns to the ground, and the media's like, oh, no, 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 no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It doesn't just catch fire. Well, but this is, hold on. I'm telling a story. You're, you're fucking it up. As usual, you're all right. fucking it all up. All um, right. So that's the way the media reports it. And then what happens, and I, I remember this, you know, being, watching this basically live. That the yeah, me too. People on the chans figured it out because they were listening to the live radio traffic. And the first thing that they notice is that they uh, the police order all the, the, the news helicopters away from the cabin. Yeah. <laughs> So they, that's a telltale sign. <laughs> yeah, they, they order all the helicopters out of the area, and so they're still circling on the margins, you know, where they're allowed to be. And then they see smoke, and the people on the chans are listening to the live radio traffic, and they hear police officers say, "Burn it down, burn it down, uh, burn them out of there, and burn that motherfucker, burn that motherfucker." And then separately, they also say, "Deploy the burners." And, and they say it in such a way in the radio. Deploy the, burners, deploy the burners according to the plan that we talked about. All right, Steve, we're going to go uh, We're gonna go forward with the plan with the, with the burner. Right. That's what they say, according to the plan. And, and you know, from a lot of different uh, political killings, like the Branch Davidians, um, you know, the Ruby Ridge siege. Ruby Ridge, uh, right. What's the, guy, what's the guy's name from uh, the nation's? It's like an 82. You know, the, the government clearly has a operating procedure. Oh, I know, I know you're talking about. Where, yeah. where they just burn people out. And then, you know, if you stay in, you die. You know, they don't care. But um, you come out, you die. Right, anyway. Right. You die. And and they they had radio tra they have radio traffic now that basically confirms that that is their procedure. So, you know, the chance are listening to this and it's like, holy shit. I mean, can you believe what we're listening to? And um, and uh, well, the the great the great one of, one of the great quotes, and we have this in the show notes, is from KCAL, in which you hear "burn that motherfucker," uh, you know, across the radio, which they're they're live streaming, you know, while they're you know showing helicopter footage of you know the the firefight. Burn that fucking house! Get going right now! Fucking burn that fucking house! And then one of the reporters says. You know, well, you know, you, you can obviously tell that the that the police are under a lot of stress right now. Right. You know, just trying to cover for their ass. Yeah. You know, bullshit. They're 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 assassinating that man. Right. And you don't know who who made you judge, jury, and executioner. Right. Right. No, that's but exactly anyway. right. Well, and, and, and he has an uninvestigated claims, right? He's making very specific accusations about official malfeasance, and then he's being killed, and nobody's asking any of these questions. And he's clearly... He's and, clearly and they have no proof. They have no proof that he has done anything. Right, right. They have assumption. They have Chinese whispers. They have bullshit. Right. You know? And... Like, fuck them. But, I mean, I think it's, it's important to say that it... It is. There's no doubt anymore. You know, after the after the Waco siege, and I looked up the other guy, Robert Matthews uh, from the from the Navy. Mm. Um, the government has had a strategy for dealing with these situations where they just burn you alive, 
And and we saw it with Christopher Dorner, right? The mask for the the system's mask slipped off in a big way for a lot of people who were just internet keyboard warriors, where they're like, oh my God, my government is killing someone, possibly for a straightly political motive, right? And that's that's a pretty dramatic realization. Um I don't know what's really going on with Dorner. I kind of wonder if there even is some That's your opinion. You know, this guy's politics make no sense. His ideology makes no sense. Um, so, you know, you, you see that the media is is not reporting this salient fact, right? And then the other thing that's interesting is CBS News is there on site, and they're not reporting this. And then the other thing that they, they hear over the radio traffic is uh, that they're specifically telling the fire department not to come near the scene. Yeah, that, that, that was pretty wild. And so if you think a fire has just accidentally broken out, right, I have no idea how it happened. Wouldn't you be concerned that maybe Christopher Dorner has hostages? Is there anything you can tell us about what happened that morning? I mean, there's lots of questions about whether he was in that condo for days, hours. I mean, do you know that, number one? And what happened to the people that were in there before he stole the first car? I don't believe that there were anybody in there on Thursday. At the start of the investigation, we don't believe that there was anybody in that cabin that is somebody that either a rental or the owner. If you think that he just recently took hostages, you're not concerned that maybe his current cabin has hostages in it? Innocent people that you're burning alive? Um, well, unless they have like thermal scanners in which they know how many people are inside the cabin. A hundred miles away, helicopters with heat-seeking technology comb the snowy mountains over Big Bear. Correct. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. Sure. That's all. And so, you know, in, in so, so the official story is that he died. He committed suicide in the basement. He, you know, put a nine millimeter to his right temple, pulled the trigger, done deal. Um, his, which, by the way, that doesn't even make sense because everybody knows you don't fucking put that into your head. You put it inside your mouth, it blows the back back of your head off. So you make sure you get it done. Well, whatever. Uh, I'm just, I'm serious. But his body, his body was so burned that they couldn't even identify the race of the body. And his head, his head was so disintegrated that they couldn't. I they they made no identification based off of his off of his head. The main way they made identification was off of. A badge <laughs> and his driver's another license. badge, another badge, and a driver's license that they found in the body's pocket. Um, Holy shit! The auto isn't that convenient. They, they, That's really fucking convenient. They and the badge him. and neither the badge nor the driver's license burned. They can't even do, they can't even tell what race the motherfucker is, but somehow his driver's license survived that shit. Um. Bro. Shit! All the plastic on his Glock melted, uh, so they had trouble identifying. But not the driver's license. Yeah, but not the driver's license. Not the driver's license. Um. So hold on, a second. I gotta pee. Oh my god, I've gotta pee. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome. Really, what, like a twelve-year-old girl or what? 
Well, I'm drinking a lot of alcohol, so <laughs> like, you know, you gotta go when you're putting this much uh, liquid into your body. It's got to come out at some point. Yes. All right, let's let's get this thing fucking done. Um, it's gonna be a bitch to edit. Good, good episode so far, except for, except for all your parts. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Ah. Words from our sponsors and uh, Fire and Ice and Fireball Whiskey. So, you know, like they clearly burned down the cabin, but that's the first thing. And, and, and the Internet knows it. Right. And so this is still 2013. I think the media feels a lot more cocky with what it can get away with. Um, and, um, you know, to nothing- a certain extent, which is which is much less than in previous years. Right. True. I mean, like. They, they still had to acknowledge that there was some issue, but go ahead, yeah. But but this issue of the cops purposely burning down the cabin spreads, no pun intended, like wildfire. Burn that motherfucker! Burn that fucking house! Get going right now! Fucking burn that motherfucker! Yeah. Go ahead. And, um, you know, everybody can hear it. Everybody can hear the basic audio. They can see... Burn that motherfucker! All right, Steve, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go forward with the plan with the, with the burner. They can see the video and they can say to themselves, this highly intelligent, highly motivated, goody two shoes, mass, you know, possible mass murderer probably didn't set himself on fire. Right? Burn that motherfucker! Seven burners deployed and we have a fire. Copy, seven burners deployed and we have a fire. So, you know, the story starts falling apart and the media has to go into overdrive to cover for it. Now, what the police say is like, oh, we, of course we didn't burn it down. I can tell you that it was not on purpose. We did not intentionally burn down that cabin to get Mr. Dorner out. The tear gas canisters that we used, first off, we used a presence when we showed up. Secondly, we used a cold tear gas. Then we used, sec- the next tear gas was that that was uh, pyrotechnic. Does generate a lot of heat. Uh, we had introduced those canisters into the residence and a fire erupted. It was, I mean, the pyrotechnic type canisters are commonly referred to as burners. Sure. And this starts to reveal, I think, what, what is the, the fundamental flaw in, in even honest reporting, which is their only valuable source is the police. And so right. the only place that they that most reporters can even get any information is the police. And are the police going to honestly disclose information that hurts their case at trial or that huh. makes them look bad? Of course not. Laugh. Right. Of course not. Of course not. Why would they? Right. And so, you know, this isn't a court of law. There's no penalty for them to frame things up a certain way. In- uh, unlike unlike actually having to answer questions in front of like you know FBI agents, which does carry actual legal consequences, lying to a member of the press is not a violation of any law anywhere. And so th- you have this 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 endless sea of media outlets that breathlessly report that well the police did not start the fire. Well, okay, Cracker Jack, then how the fuck did it start? Right? I mean, if the police didn't do it, then how did it start? And for a while, they try to make the argument that Dorner himself said it. All right, Steve, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go forward with the plan with the, with the burner. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> well, this is, what? He's, he's just a crazy man. It's just, he's pinned down in a cabin and he just sets himself on fire. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, um, great idea. Asshole. Right. And honestly, like in doing the research for this show, there's no way to find any, uh, any resolution to this except for, I found a deleted document on, I believe it was the San Bernardino website that finally admitted years later, they finally admitted that instead of using CS gas, which is what they told the media they used, which is in itself flammable, right? But they did not use it <clears throat> because Dorner had put mattresses against the uh, windows. And so they did not think it was going to be effective. 
they brought in a bulldozer to push in a hole and they sprayed in pyrotechnic gas. Well, just from the name, if you're not a moron, you should know what pyrotechnic <laughs> gas means. It's called. Uh, well, first off, they 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 didn't call it py- uh, they, they did not call, initially call it pyrotechnic gas. Well, the, that was the lie to the media. But the, oh. the San Bernardino report says the phrase "We did not use CS gas; we used pyrotechnic gas for these reasons." That is the that is the final revelation that that the the lie that the police did not set the fire. They did purposely burn that cabin down with zero fucks given about who was in there. That's and that's a fact. That's a that, fact that's, that's not, not up for dispute anymore. And if you look, even today, you can find news article after news article, CBS News, ABC News. And they'll say, well, the police say that they didn't set the fire. And then they never answer the next question of, well, then logically, where the fuck did it come from? Seven burners deployed and we have a fire. Copy, seven burners deployed and we have a fire. Do cabins just suddenly start, you know, fire? Did they, did they have? Well, there, there is a, in, okay, in, in I'm going to push back a little bit. There, there is a, there is a. Uh, I've seen a, 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 a video of the San Bernardino, I don't know, sheriff, whoever the the top, the top cop is, and he says pyrotechnic. Oh, he doesn't say gas. He he calls it a, a pyrotechnic. He he equates it to basically like a a pyrotechnic flashbang. Then we used. The next tier gas was that that was uh, pyrotechnic. Does generate a lot of heat. Uh, we in- introduced those canisters into the residence, and a fire erupted. It was, I mean, the pyrotechnic type canisters are commonly referred to as burners. Basically, that's that's how he describes it. Well, so so there. It's interesting that even today. Um, the media, you know, the media is still lying about this. Uh, and the, the two, the two worst defenders, at least on YouTube, uh, is of course, of course, CNN. Um, and then the, the, the second, why ever would you say that? I know, I know. (laughs) And then the the second worst defender is, um, uh, ABC and ABC, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not ABC, CBS. Same comment. Um, you know, also same comment. Plays plays this this little game. So the name of the YouTube video, and we'll play a little clip uh, for for you to listen to it. Uh, but the name, the title of the CNN video here. Is, why don't we play? We'll play that right now. Here we go. Well, no, no, no. Hold on, hold on. It's no. I'm gonna play it right now. The, the title of the it. clip is. I'm playing it. I'm playing it. Did the cops deliberately burn down cabin? Audio on the ground from a CBS2 KCAL reporter mentioned a smoke grenade. And then, in the chaos, someone, we don't know who, was heard yelling. Real-time police audio transmissions at Big Bear Lake were preserved, and the second guessing started immediately. Though we don't know how the fire started, to the untrained ear, after authorities concluded they had someone in this cabin in the woods, it sounded to some like they could have intentionally set fire to it to try to smoke out the suspect. We're going to go forward with the plan with the, with the burner. Got it. About 23 minutes later, an early reference to burners being deployed. Seven burners deployed and we have a fire. Copy, seven burners deployed and we have a fire. A former U.S. Marshal and expert on fugitive apprehension told me that based on the audio, he does not believe the authorities on the scene tried to burn down the house. At that point, it could be just bravado, but again, there's no operating plan that calls for torching a home in order to get a suspect out. The term burners heard on the audio was once used as slang for tear gas canisters, though police generally no longer use gas that can catch fire. Obviously, we want to gas the individual out of the house. Um, They're non-incendiary type devices, so um, they wouldn't have any possibility of of, uh, catching the house on fire. Does it sound like 
the authorities, the deputies, the police did anything wrong? I don't, at this point, no. I don't think they did anything wrong. The final word could come from an investigation and autopsy. Former medical examiner Jonathan Arden says a coroner has a pretty good chance of determining whether fire killed the suspect or if he killed himself to avoid being taken alive. Most people who die from fires die from inhalation of the smoke and the toxic products. So we look for soot down into the airways. We look for carbon monoxide in the blood. And those are the indications of someone who was alive in the fire. And if you have enough of those uh, poisons, basically, uh, somebody who died from the fire. All right. They did. They did burn down the... So let's dis dissect their, their propaganda here. First off, they pose this innocent question as though they're going to honestly answer it. You know, you're, uh -huh. you're meant to kind of presume that they're objective. The second thing they do is they frame up the audio as, well, we don't really know who was yelling, meaning it could be anybody, right? Maybe it's not even a police officer. They're making the original piece of evidence. Some random asshole in the middle of February in the mountains, in the snow, saying, burn that motherfucker. Right, right. Exa as if they don't know that it's a, a, a police officer. And also, As if who the fuck's in the goddamn mountains in goddamn February in the middle of winter in the god fucking mountains? I mean, come on. Well, also, who's on the radio in the mountains, right? Like, who I mean, yes. I mean, what the fuck? Right. And then the three... Uh, they they f use the phrase second guessing the police, right? And that's a very loaded term, right? Second guessing presumes that the police on the ground were making decisions to save their lives. And how dare we second guess their decisions? You only second guess. How dare we not second guess their fucking decisions? They, they have not earned the right to not be second guessed. Well, but they have the power of life and death. You, you only second guess a correct decision, right? There's a correct decision, and then there's the second guess. And the, cor the, the correct decision here was not to burn him alive, but that's not the question. The question is, did the cops burn, burn the cabin down? There is no primary guess that they didn't, right? There's no evidence that it was an accident. The, nobody has ever presented evidence that it's an accident, but it's, uh, but it's second guessing you know, the police to say that, well, maybe they did because they said burn it down. And then fourth, it presents a false conclusion when they say, quote, we don't know how the fire started. Well, guess what, CNN? When the police are saying over, over the radio to burn it down and then a fire immediately starts, don't you think that that's kind of a, a pretty easy connection to make? It's like, hold on there, professor. Hold on there, professor. <laughs> they fired off. <laughs> they, they fired off six rounds of pyrotechnic gas or whatever the fuck that is. It's something that sets fire really easily. Right. So pretty sure that that's the cause. <laughs> right. But no, according to CNN, we don't know how the fire started. Oh, and then <laughs> fifth, mystery there. fifth, CNN uses this phrase, the untrained ear. Meaning your ear, right? <laughs> and it, it's think about what they're saying with with that phrase. To it may it may occur to the untrained ear. It's a way of saying that you're too stupid to interpret what your own ears are hearing. It's a way of saying even though it says burn it down, that has nothing to do with the cabin fire that started thirty seconds later. Burn that motherfucker! Burn that fucking house! Yeah, the sixth thing with the CNN, the CNN clip is they use the phrase "it sounded to some." All right, Steve, we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna go forward with the plan with the with the burner. Seven burners deployed, and we have a fire. Copy. Seven burners deployed, and we have a fire. It sounded to some. It's a nice way to. Run that motherfucker. <laughs> It's a nice way to marginalize the people who doubt the official story, right? Who doubts what was said? Oh, it was the police, the people who set the fire. It's like saying it sounded to some that the murder victim was crying out for help. But here we have the alleged murderer saying, actually, she was begging for more by saying help, right? Burn that motherfucker. Like it, it sounded to everybody that burn that motherfucker means they're going to burn the cabin down. And then, it sounded to fucking everyone and their goddamn brother. Right. No one, no one 
could possibly understand that to mean anything other than what it was. Right. And then the fire started by accident, you know, just immediately oh. thereafter. Who knew? I know. Who knew? It's on. Burners burn. And burners the- fucking burn. Number seven, you know, CNN justifies the action it was investigating by saying that even if they did set the fire, they did so to, quote, smoke out the suspect. That's that's the phrase they use. They're just trying to smoke him out. They're never bothering. This is really, this is really interesting. Go on. They're never bothering to ask if the police are surrounding your cabin and firing into it. Maybe they want to kill you. Maybe they're not trying to smoke you out. Maybe well, they're, maybe they're, maybe they're not you. allowing you to leave. Right. Dorner's manifesto indicates he is prepared to die. If they do manage to find him, don't be surprised if the LAPD obliges. I'm David Wright for Nightline in Los Angeles. Like that's that's the thing. In, in like a- to smoke you out implies that they're going to allow you to surrender if you exit the cabin. But there's no evidence that they allowed him to do that, right? That's right. In in fact, the the police even said at one point they said, oh, he tried to leave and we forced him back in. So if you just took the police's own words at face value, the only reasonable conclusion you'd come to is, oh, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to burn him alive. But the, this is such a like a subversive thing the media does. They take an obvious conclusion and then they work backwards very subtly and subversively to kind of work your mind away from the obvious. There's literally no evidence that they wanted to smoke him out. The only evidence is that they wanted to burn it down. Number eight. You know, I, I think just as a, as a side point here, I think that we should interview some of these different particular media advocates of the fucking party line mm-hmm. because they're part, they are now part of the story. Oh yeah. Right. No, they, they, they honestly need like a, they need to get full blast on what they, on the lies that they, <laughs> they need to get ass blasted. Yeah. They need a fucking enemy. But I'm not done with CNN. Hold on. Number eight. Oh, please, please continue. Yeah. Number eight. Later they reference burners, right? And they shift the entire segment onto that word instead of the phrase, burn it down. Right. And it's a subtle difference, but it's important, right? Saying burners makes it sound like it's official, like it's like something that cops have in, the, in their in their trunk, right? They say, like it's a tactic. It's a legitimate tactic, right? But it, it takes it it takes it from a verb to a noun, right? A burner is a thing. Burn it down is an action, right? And so you 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 start to think, well, maybe this was a piece of equipment that went wrong. And, and they talk about burners like they're the Sky Mall for cops, right? Like, oh, well, every cop knows that you have burners, right? Like, you, you have burners to smoke people out. That's what they're there for. They're not- I've, come, I've, I've come across a number, I mean, just as an aside, I've come across a number of different SWAT, um, SWAT experts on the internet mm-hmm. uh, from a variety of different interviews. I've come, I've come across at least three different, SWAT, you know, 20 year veterans of, of different SWAT forces across the country. And they, they've never heard of this. So. Well, and, that's, and that's the last part of the clip, actually, where, you know, number nine, they, they, they trot out this expert who works for the system and then validates the conclusion to say there's not, nothing wrong happened here. And he, ah! he says that there's no operating procedure that says that you should burn a home down. Well, no shit that they're not going to list murder the suspect in the police manual, right? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm shocked that they don't say burn that motherfucker down is like a code 1411, right? Like, hey, code 1411 dispatch, um, I'm going to murder the... 1411, 1411, 1411, now! Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, CNN, in just one minute of television, is putting a lot of very sophisticated psychology deployed for one purpose – to make you believe that the cops didn't burn that 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 cabin down, even though now we know they the cops even admit that they they did it, um, and so they would much prefer I think to just ignore the whole theory altogether. But the internet made them made them have to address it because the internet was able to to listen to it, preserve it, and amplify it. People were starting to figure this shit out, and then they had to swoop in to answer it so that people didn't come to the the right conclusions. Well, a certain group of people were able to figure it out. Right. And then, coincidentally, that same certain group of people started to be attacked. 
for totally different reasons. <laughs> but that's a different. But that's a different show, isn't yeah. it? You need to stop drinking. Um, and and this really reveals, I think, what a control job the media is and what it really does. It never gives us new news. It doesn't actually provide new information. It serves as rhetorical cover for our occupiers. They're the press agents of the people in power. They're there to confuse you about what you see with your own eyes and your ears because you might inadvertently figure out what was really going on. Christopher Dorner was killed. If he really died in that cabin, he was killed as official policy. And you can hear it on the radio. Burn that fucking house, Get going right now. Fucking burn that fucking house. You can hear it when they, they call the, the uh, helicopters away. You can hear it when they call the fire department away. And fuck you to anyone who tries to tell me otherwise. But they will never admit that they just killed him. They couldn't say it was an accident. They couldn't say it was a whoopsie poopsie, we set the cabin on fire. They, they say that Dorner did it to himself. And that's also why I think, you know, one of the last lies is, oh, you know, he killed himself. And and they even went, the, the uh, coroner went out of their way to say, well, he didn't die from the fire or the smoke inhalation. He died from the, the gun gun blast to his head. That was what killed him, right? You know, and they have to say that. They have to say that because they clearly set the fire. They set the fire on purpose. Um, welcome to Crime Thing. Uh, crime Thing. Crime Thing. The other crime thing that, I mean, you just got to, I mean, I got to mention here is CNN obviously had to use a black reporter to do this little con job. Um <laughs> And, you know, I don't think it's any surprise that, you know, Joe Johns got a promotion, like a once in a career promotion to like senior editor or senior correspondent the next year. So, oh, really? yeah, I mean, it's, it's a total, it's a total bag of dicks. I mean, the, that's, that's depressing. Yeah. It's, it's really something. I mean, if we could find somebody to call and harass, fuck you, Joe Johns, I'm coming for you. Yeah. Um, so and then they the, do the other the other clip is the CBS clip and you know their their headline is did Let's play that right now well their headline is did police right now right burn now a cabin? right 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 now now there are still questions tonight about the fire at the California cabin where police cornered an ex cop bent on revenge was that blaze an accident or did law enforcement set it on purpose Carter Evans has the latest on the investigation. We're getting a first look at the charred remains of the cabin where alleged cop killer Christopher Dorner made his last stand on Tuesday. We were there, caught in the crossfire. The gun battle was so intense, we were forced to take cover, but we left our cell phone on. At the very beginning of the shootout, you can hear authorities near the phone talking about burning Dorner out of the cabin he was holed up in. Over the next three hours, authorities brought in reinforcements, armored vehicles, more SWAT teams, and this battering ram, which authorities told me at the scene, would be used to deploy a powerful form of tear gas, also known as a burner, into the cabin. The burner gives off intense heat, which often causes a fire. Recordings of police scanners during the final assault confirm their plan. We're going to go forward with the plan with the, with the burner, like we talked about. Despite those recordings, the day after the shootout, San Bernardino County Sheriff John McMahon insisted that it was not on purpose. We did not intentionally burn down that cabin to get Mr. Dorner out. We've repeatedly asked the Sheriff's Department for a response, but no one has returned our calls. Here at headquarters today, they have de declined to answer any questions ahead of a press conference, which is scheduled to take place in about 20 minutes. Anthony? Carter Evans. Thank you, Carter. So to answer CBS News's clip, they say, did police intentionally burn Dorner cabin? You know, they kind of come out strong, and you're like, wow, maybe CBS will be objective. Like, who knew? And then they just kind of, like, easily slip in that quote that burner means tear gas from a battering ram, right? Just a little sleight of hand, nothing to see here, kids. Good thing the cabin didn't burn down or anything, or I might have been confused. Um, and they... <laughs> You know, they, but they totally saw and, and CBS is on the ground and CBS knows what's really going on. And instead of saying, oh, maybe over radio, they're saying burn that mother down and like burn them out. 
that, oh, they're just talking about burners, and burners just means tear gas. Well, burner doesn't mean tear gas. San Bernardino has finally admitted that burner does not mean tear gas. Burner means pyrotechnic gas. That means fucking flamethrowers, right? They set the fire. They intentionally set the fire. They intentionally burned down the Dorner cabin. If you listen to CBS, you are worse off than somebody who didn't know anything about it because you're being you're filling your head with fucking lies. Same thing with CNN. Amen. And that's that's the quality of the reporting on on Chris Dorner is if the most of the time they're not reporting anything. They're just barfing back whatever the police say. But the few times that they actually have some information to dig into, they just ignore it. Now, the left well, the left sometimes talks about Chris Dorner, and they only talk about it in the context of, oh, well, he complained about racism, and therefore he suits our agenda, right? And I think, you know, I don't want to say crime think has, a, has an agenda, but of everything has an agenda, right? And And – you know, Rick and I, we don't like Chris Dorner ideologically. Like, we don't like Chris Dorner really personally. But was the man correct? And was the man killed for no reason? Yes. I mean, I think he was right. And I think he was killed. And, like, God, our fucking well, society. Was, was he certainly, I mean, was he killed for no reason? I mean, that's that's a harder question. Was he killed? Without due process of law, absolutely. Well, he was surrounded. Was he killed? Was he killed, was he killed illegally? Yes, unquestionably. Well, he was. He was. He was, totally he was killed illegally. Like, where was? No pun intended. Where was the fire? Right. Like, where's? <laughs> well, where's the earth? Right. Well, and and that's the thing. If they believed that he had done all these different things that they say that he did, which. There's not a lot of evidence. I mean, frankly, with what we've been able to find, I mean, and, and our investigation is going to continue over the next, you know, weeks and months. We spent an awful lot of time over the past several weeks and years investigating this particular issue. And we have found no evidence that he actually killed any of these people at all. Yeah. There's no physical evidence that he killed any of these people. Right. That's pretty impressive. So here's the thing. If you don't have any physical evidence that some asshole has actually done anything, you know, do you have the right to just execute him? Right. And the answer is you don't. If you're the police and if you're anybody, but if you're especially if you're the police, you, you have to you have to see him to justice, which means you have to bring him in. Now, it's a different story if, there, you know, it's a matter of self-defense. But affirmatively burning down the fucking you know cabin is not a matter of self defense. That's you, know, you just you fucking killed his ass, right? And there, right. there are some people who I think uh, have an attitude that the cops are always lying and that the cops are always wrong and the cops are always corrupt, right? And, and honestly, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But usually, in most criminal cases, the the defendant is not at war with the police, right? The defendant is at war with another victim. And here, Correct. what's so different is here is a former cop who has official grievances and political, political statements to make. And he's at war with the system itself. And I think, well, and not just at the state level either. Right. Right. With the feds as well. And I think that this case really deserves a much greater examination than it ever got. And, and frankly, probably will ever get. Um, and we're going to do our, our small part, you know, for you. Our, Fucking A, right? We are. Our, our loyal zero listeners right now. Um, but. Uh, hey, to quote, to quote Chocolate Rambo, it's a matter of integrity. Well, it's just like, you know. I think as kids, we... But it, it really is. You know, I think as kids, and I think this relates to Dorner in a big way, like we... And, and to, to talk about, like, the legacy of Dorner, um, you know, I think for for men of a certain time period, which I would generally lump myself in with you know, with Dorner's generation, and I think you too, Rick. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, we were... We grew up on, like, certain lies that were really tasted great. 
right? I mean, it tasted like. Well, there are certain lines that actually make a, they make a hell of a lot of sense in a certain way. Right. Right. And, and, um, you know, you're never told as a kid how much shit that you have to eat as an adult. Right. Like, oh, God. Well, cause you wouldn't make it. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And you would never be told like how much injustice that you have to suffer as an adult. Um, and, and no one ever even honestly says, you know, like how many cat ladies are in power in society and how petty and shitty they are about it. Okay, Karen. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck you, Karen. And, um, and, and cat ladies who also, by the way, don't care about truth. Right. They're not. Out that's, to, a, that's a hard pill to swallow. It's absolutely true. They're not out the truth. They're not out to resolve things peacefully. Yeah. They're not like, you know, they're not, they have no, they have no compassion. They have no mercy. They have no understanding. I mean, they are, they are like a T 400 model Terminator out from the future to kill you. I mean, they, they just, they have no compassion. And, you know, he ran up against this. He ran up against this, this uh, tension. And, and, you know, if, if you believe what everything said, you know, he went nuts. Um, and I think another legacy for people who, who witnessed all this is uh, to really understand that, like, as you, as you get in your 30s, you understand that career advancement is not about working hard. And I think you see that in the Dorner case too, where if things are true, he learned the hard way that it was not about being a goody two shoes who showed up on time every day. Right. Well, and, and real, real quick, just a side point to that. That's actually, interestingly enough, that really, that's a point that a number of different news articles make because they've interviewed a lot of different people who were associated with Dorner and all of them, all of them say that Dorner was a hard worker. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they go out of their way to say he was the one who was showing everyone else up. Okay. Inspiring them on to go forward. Right. Even in the hardest of exercises. I mean, he, they they go out of their way to emphasize this point that he was willing to go the distance. Right. But anyway, but go on. Um, and, and so, you know, like what, what, what other kind of lessons do people like that have they learned? Um, you know, <laughs> power relationships in the workplace are zero sum and like career advancements the same way. Like you think that a rising tide lifts all boats, right? That old JFK quote. Well, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. And, and people don't look at it that way, right? If if you get a promotion at work, that's a promotion either I should have had or a friend of mine should have had, right? Like people people see everything as win lose. And that's it sucks. You know, and I don't want to live that way, but it's it is how people look at things. Well, and and so um, imagine imagine you're a person. Okay, so the manifesto paints Christopher Dorner in a, in a particular way. It, frankly, it, it paints Christopher Dorner in a way that's somewhat realistic, somewhat realistic into, uh, you know, it, it's believable that he could be somebody that 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 is this naive. OK, he's someone who was, you know, raised to believe that if you work hard, you get rewarded. Right. right. If, if you do certain things. You're going to get rewarded. If you follow the rules, you're going to get rewarded, right? Right. And then he does everything, everything that somebody told him he was supposed to do. Right. He was supposed, and, and not only that, he did it at great pain, right? I mean, like, for example, again, I, I go back to, you know, when he was, you know, turning in Teresa Evans. He didn't want to do that. This is, you know, he says in his manifesto, no one wants to grow up to be a cop killer. He says that. Right. He said, you know, who would want, who would want this? Right. For them. And so, you know, I mean, and at the same time, he followed all these different rules. And then all of a sudden he was hit with the hard reality that none of this shit fucking mattered as to his own personal advancement or even security. 
In fact, it was a liability. Right. I mean, and frankly, that has got to be a destabilizing event in anyone's life. You know, so, I mean, I'm not saying that, that, that Dorner was not psychotic. Something like this could make somebody psychotic very quickly. Like, you know, all of a sudden, a, a come to Jesus, right? Well, I, very, I, very I, don't, I still don't think the timelines work out. But I do think that in terms of the legacy of, yeah, of, no, I, I agree. of, of, of the viewing audience, of the people who watch this, you know, and it didn't it didn't make it, it made national news at the time, but they've been kind of careful to memory hole it. And it's it's really it's really been forgotten. That's one reason we wanted to bring attention to it in our show here. Uh, but I think for the viewing audience, you know, you're exactly right on, on what you say. And I think kind of to take that a little step further, Rick, is uh, we all we all empathize with the fact that for someone like Dorner and someone like ourselves, that the, the penalty for career failure is enormous these days, right? I mean, there's no loyalty from your superiors. You're treated as hired help on good days. And a small misstep, a small mistake might mean like, hey, your lifelong goal of being a cop or like your lifelong goal of serving the public or being in the Navy is over. Or, lit- or literally anything at any level. Right, right. And I, I mean, I think that there's this, there's definitely this... Um, Un, it's not political correctness, but sometimes it kind of lobbed lobbed in there that the power for words and branding and associations to basically kill your career. And I know that's kind of ironic. It's it's, about- it's it's liability correctness. Yeah, and I know you basically you create a liability. There's some irony about talking that, about that about a, a black man who was given a ton of opportunities, but like white people feel this 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 tension. And, and certainly I think, you know, Dorner felt this tension and I can't speak for black people, but I suppose black people probably feel it just as much as, as anybody else too. But, you know, certainly for whites, it's like, if you ever get labeled a racist at your job, you're toast, right? If you get, well, if you get labeled a, 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 you know, you abuse women or you, you, you know, are uh, sexually aggressive, you know, that will terminate your career. And for Dorner, it well, for Dorner. But I mean, with, with Dorner, I mean, if, and, and that's something that comes out in Dorner's manifesto. Dorner's manifesto, you know, he points the finger at lots of different groups of people. Right. He points he points the finger at Caucasians. He points the finger at blacks. Right. He points the finger at Asians. Right. And 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 not just and he doesn't do it in like some roundabout way. He points a finger in a very deep cut way he cuts to the quick for each of these different groups of people he cuts to their you know to as a stereotype yeah yeah it's a stereotype but it's there's a lot of truth in what he says right and 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 he's we we can all empathize with him that we all feel that same pressure that, you know, in his case, being labeled a bully or being, being labeled with a false accusation, you know, as someone who files, you know, false statements or false accusations against colleagues, you know, he felt that that was going to terminate not just a five year pattern in his flight pattern in his life or a 10 year flight pattern, you know, that was the equivalent of killing him. Right. You know, he had given up a family, you know, and a a happy, happy marriage in order to pursue this, this, these choices for him. And, you know, it was very personal to him. And I think, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of white people in the Midwest who feel like, Hey, if I, if I get out of line at work, I may not get employment again for a year or two. And I may suffer a permanent career downgrade because well, and there, I fuck and up. That, and that's a very, that's a very legitimate fear. So I mean I think there's there's a lot of people who can empathize with Dorner who who weren't in the military, aren't black, you know, don't, you know, aren't cops. You know, and that's that's one reason why I think his story resonates so much is because there's there's a lot about his story that that is reminiscent of certain patterns and I mean I I've thought about this for I mean I guess for about 7 years now, right? And I think it's the lie. People can't handle the lie. Yeah, they can't handle on any level. There are so many different lies that are being told within the story, and people just simply cannot—they can't tolerate it. Yeah, 
Okay. And so I think, I think that that is what is the, that that's the universal thing that, that, that just jumps out at you, that, that, that compels you, that throttles you. When, when you start talking about Chris Dorner, he is a man who has different, who has a, a particular point of view and it's not a perfect point of view, but he has a, he has a particular version of right and wrong, which resonates with the majority of people in this country, white, black, brown, red, whatever. Okay. Yeah. And so when they see, when they see the lie and they see the lie exposed, it hits a raw nerve. It hits a real raw nerve. Well, and I think again, to take that a little bit further too, is that the Dorner story kind of confirms to us that the media is lying to us in many different ways and then it's, all the time. And it's not like a black or white issue. It's not a class issue. It's, it's a power issue. Yes. You know, it's, it's Dorner was threatening the power structure of, of California and he was threatening the oligarchs, you know, no matter how compelling that story may have been, every media outlet decided to cover for the police. So the other, other legacies I think of the, of the Dorner case um, is that for the people who actually read the manifesto, you know, From greedies. you talked about it, that the level of specificity that was in there and the level of detail really kind of confirms what we all know, that there's a total double standard for people in power. And, um, you know, I think really, it begs the question of like, why don't more people snap like this? Right. There are child custody disputes every day. There's family court happening every day. There are wrongful prosecutions. There are shitty things that happen with property taxes and your county appraisals, uh, tax liens, employee terminations, and really just kind of a lack of humanism in all of our institutions. Right. And there's really no like powerful, just arbitrator left. And if a man like Chris Dorner can't get justice, uh, aren't we really just kind of daring them to freak out, right? Why don't people do this? Why aren't more people freaking out? Frankly, I think it's probably alcohol. Hmm, maybe. I mean, no, I mean, I, I think it's alcohol or other, you know, things to just like, you know, dampen your resolve and help you to get through a certain, you know, uh, problem. If you're, if you're, if you're not going to imbibe some alcohol and get a little drunk, you know, and, and let it roll off your back, well, then you've got to do something about it, right? You've got to address, you got to scratch that itch. And if you're going to scratch that itch, it's going to be something that's violent because that's all that's left, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, because you know, isn't isn't that your point? Uh, yeah. What I mean, else is it? What what else is there? Yeah, there's 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 a lot of uh, there's a lot of you're you're not going to get justice through the courts. No. You're not going to get justice through some uh, administrative you know entity. You're not going to get justice anywhere else. You know, and of course, you know, at the state or the federal level. I mean, and and, and shit. It, it's you know, it's even worse when you talk about the courts, but even though theoretically it shouldn't be that way, but if, you know, at, at every level you're cut off. If you're an average asshole, if you, if you're basically, if you're not a, a, a multi, 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 multi millionaire, then you are shit and you can eat shit and go fuck yourself. Fuck you and your whole family yeah. period. And guess what? We can kill you. We can kill your whole family. We can destroy you. We will destroy you. We'll take away your job. We'll take away your career. We'll take away your future. We'll take away your kid's future. What are you going to do about it, asshole? Well, and I think the system can set like really high standards and people would ultimately meet those standards, right? I mean, humans are pretty adaptable. But, uh, you know, when you when you lie, when the system is corrupt and perverted, right, and looking into his appeal filing, you know, they really did just invert the, the, the burdens of proof so that Dorner had to prove that something happened that had, that had already administratively been ruled couldn't be proven in order to clear his name. And so, you know, it makes a certain amount of sense that maybe that is what caused him to freak out, especially if that was going to threaten his, 
his career in the Navy. If he, if he had moved on from something that had happened to him six years ago, and then all of a sudden that came back to bite him. And four years ago. Well, the, the exoneration happened four years ago, but the, the incident itself was, was 2007. And so if, if he paid an, an attorney to file an appeal and that attorney came back to him and said, Hey, sorry, we totally got screwed, you know, by the, the court of claims and you can appeal it to the Supreme court, but you're probably going to lose there too. And sorry, your, your, you know, administrative hearing guy really screwed you uh, for these reasons. You know, maybe that was enough to send him over the top. You know, maybe he spent like his entire life savings on that appeal and just got like rudely. So the incident happened in, you know, July of 2007, right? He was terminated in approximately January of 2009. Um, And then he went through a variety of different appeals. He went to the state court. He went to the state appellate court where he was eventually, you know, shut down on October 3rd of 2011. You know, at that point, the, the logical assumption is is that somehow this affected his, you know, his work with the Navy as a reserve officer. We do know, we do know he was honorably discharged and that he was honorably discharged subsequent to a, a uh, an affirmative decision by the Navy uh, to not continue him and to basically deny his re-up. So, you know, in the, oh, in I the don't, military... I don't so you found evidence that the Navy declined to extend his 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 career, basically. Yes, yes. Let's let's take a, a thirty second break. Right. I gotta go pee. God, how much booze are you drinking, you fucker? <laughs> I mean, clearly not enough. It's a long road when you're on your own, and it hurts when. They tear your dreams apart And every new town Just seems to bring you down Welcome to Crime Think Welcome to Crime Think Welcome to Crime Think Welcome to Crime Think It's a You know, we're talking about kind of the legacy of of Dorner, and you know why people don't don't wake out like this more often. And uh, you know, there isn't there isn't really a good reason. I think a good explanation why. Um, you know, I think there's well, nobody wants to die, right? And I think if if somebody were interested in doing more research on this topic after, you know, I don't know about you, Rick. I mean, I'd estimate we probably each put in. I don't know, 10 to 20 hours worth of research into this each. Um, you know, there are a lot of documents. Probably, probably more than that, but yeah. Yeah, there, there are a lot of documents that are out there. Uh, but there's definitely some people who would be interesting to talk to who don't seem to have talked to the media at all, right? And that includes Dorner's mother, right? Nancy Dorner, who's still apparently uh, alive. Um, uh, Dorner's appellate attorneys, uh, you know, weren't, weren't spoken to. I don't, I didn't see any quotes from Randall Kwan in any, in any articles. It'd be interesting to see. You know, who has not been interviewed besides his mother, his ex-wife. He has an ex-wife. He divorced in 2007. Right. Or in 2007, 2008. That woman has never come forward. He has a few, he has at least, at least one ex-girlfriend, who has gone come forward to CNN in his manifesto? He does thank all the women that he has slept with, regard, irrespective of their of the quality of their sex. So, supreme gentleman. Um, <laughs> he didn't name names. He did not name names. So, um, you know, I think there's there's a few other people that would be interesting to talk to. Uh, one, I think the the San Diego boat story should be completely debunked. Um, the Corona Riverside shootout could prop 50 50 could probably be 
totally debunked. Uh, well, we talked about we talked about whether or not there was a red light camera. Right, right. Um, you know, where's that video? The feds, the all the federal information. You know, I, I don't think I've seen in an article anywhere. You know, they're all reporting the San Bernardino and Riverside information. They're not really giving the uh, what the feds have or what the feds are using. And I think you know, Rick, we were talking about it that there's probably a lot of illegal surveillance that was used on Dorner, uh, you know, cell phone intercepts and GPS intercepts, that kind of, but there might be other stuff too that we don't even know about. Without question. Yeah. I um, mean, it, it, it's not, we, we know that this happened. We just don't know the extent to which it happened. Right. 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 Um, so, I mean, there's, there's still a lot of living people to talk to about this case. Um, and maybe with enough time having gone by, uh, they would be willing to, and we're going to try and reach out to some of them and file some FOIA requests. And if we get anything interesting back, you know, we'll, we'll do another show on it. Uh, but I think the, the TLDR on Chris Dorner is that, you know, he, he was kind of an exceptional man. And, you know, if you believe what was said about him, you know, he snapped because of official uh, injustice. And it appears that he was right. And the media really wanted to simplify this, this whole narrative into, you know, ex-cop goes crazy, kills other cops, end of story, you know, kills himself. But there's a lot more to it. And I think there's a lot of uh, doubt about many, many aspects of the official story that have never really been been looked at by an objective eye. And uh, we, we well, don't, and I think, can't I trust think the media. The other, well, I, uh, Agreed, you know, 100%. But I would say that even if you look at his story as portrayed by the media, not only is he right, he's damned right. And what's the implication of that? Mm Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, the implication is he got fucked over from a system that will fuck you over and not give two shits while doing it. And what are you going to do about it? Right. I mean, and so... Ultimately, that's the I mean, <laughs> that's the lingering problem for anyone living in society. You know what Chris Dorner demonstrates is that you can do everything right, even by their own narrative. By their own narrative, you can do everything right. You can endeavor to be this great, you know, human being. You can do things, and people will like you, and you'll have friends, and they'll respect you for working hard, even if you're not the sharpest tool in the shed. But if you call attention to the wrong people doing the wrong thing you will be destroyed yeah and and the thing about it is is that and 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 they will hate they they will not only hate you they'll kill you and they'll discredit you and they'll and they will use all of the powers of the state to destroy you to prevent the truth of your righteous expedition from coming to light right and that's it. And, and okay. And that is the and, and that is the uh, assessment based off of the official narrative, right? So imagine what the what the what the assessment from the narrative that takes into consideration the fact that you know he supposedly trashed his badge on February fifth. They found his badge again on February seventh. And they found his badge again on February 15th amongst his charred remains. His Glock plastic melted. And and if anyone has ever fired a Glock or held a Glock in their hand, if anyone actually knows anything about a Glock pistol, you know that a Glock pistol, uh, the... (laughs) The plastic of a Glock pistol is goddamn indestructible. Okay? Right? Right? And that's one of the reasons why you buy a Glock. Right. It's because it's a fucking amazing weapon. All right? Now, if the if the plastic of his Glock melted in that fire, there is no way on God's green earth that his driver's license or his badge or anything else would have survived. Right. I'm sorry. It's impossible. Right. Well, it's just like after 9/11 they found Muhammad Atta's uh, passport on the street of on the streets of 9/11 totally, you know, undamaged or Imagine that. Yeah. Holy shit. Total total magic. No, no, you're you're absolutely right in all this. And um you know, I think 
I think the system prefers to ignore the Chris Dorners of the world. Um, and he obviously did things that made it so they couldn't ignore him anymore. Um, which is, you know, why we lovingly call him chocolate Rambo, you know, fe- affectionately, you know, he was, he was a man just absolutely, absolutely. If, I mean, just make a point here. Absolutely. Affectionately when we joke about it, but it's, there's, <laughs> there is a level of affection. Yeah. But go on. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're going to see more instances like this because the system just keeps getting harsher. You know, the system has not well, learned anything from Chris right. Dorner to say, maybe we should ease up on people's throats a little bit. It's let's come down even harder and see if we can, we can squeeze these guys out. And that's only going to cause. Well, if you, want to see, if you want to see a picture of the future, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a boot on a human face. I think that's most of what we have to say on Chris Dorner for, for now. Um, you know, as if we find out more, we're going to come back. We're going to come back. We're going to come back. Yeah, we might do a deep dive on some other issues down the line. But um, I'm, I'm not done. The, the spirit of Chris Dorner lives. He's coming back. You know, and I think one one last point is, you know, With a we, we kind of rambled on a little bit in different parts here, but you know, you can't find this information easily laid out anywhere. Right. You know, there's really no comprehensive narrative on Dorner and he really deserves one. Well, we we, we have to fix that. The story and that man deserve a better treatment. Yeah. A more full treatment. Period. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Totally. Um, All right. Well, that's the end of episode four of Crime Think. Thanks for being with us. This is Bill Clay, one of your two co-hosts here with uh, Rick Smith. Slick Rick. You are part of Crime Think. It's over, Johnny. It's over. Nothing is over. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome to Crime Think. Welcome.